All right, guys, good morning. Welcome to the Hungry for More agency call. Uh, today is March 15th and excited to bring on our guest today, Easton Patton. Before we do that, we are going to share um, our scorecard, how we have done in the first uh, week of March. So we're going to start with just our issue paid numbers. Um, here are our issue paid numbers for the month of March so far, you guys. So as you see, um, we have one month, one week into March, we've done 139,565 in issue paid business after one week with 48 writers um, actively getting paid and earning a commission in the first week of March. Um, so want to shout out the top five people. Obviously, we have the top 10 on here, as you guys can see, but I just want to give a quick shout out to the top five. Rob Warner with 7,126. Darla with 7,457, Nate Fudala with 8,605, and Kent with 10,902. Great job, Kent. That's his first 10K week that he wrote a week ago, and all of his business issue paid. So that means he's putting all his business to have immediate drafts. That's how you get ahead in this business is making sure you're not for, uh, future draft dating any premium. And then leading the charge uh, the first weekend of the month, is Erica Haynes with 14,647. Great job to you guys. All right, next thing I wanna kind of share real quick is uh, a training that is coming up here, guys. Um, as you guys can see, we have an event. Uh, there, there's tons of events, actually. Um, the reason we're highlighting this one specifically is because our agency is actually hosting it. Um, so Nate Fudala, Senior Sales Manager for FFL Vertical, he's going to be hosting the Sacramento event. I will be there. Uh, many of us will be there. Um, and so if you have people in the California area within two, three hour flight, have them come down, have them uh, join us. If you have agents coming down and you want them to link up with me, text me privately, I'll be more than happy to meet them, help them any way I can to get started and do more business and make more money. So uh, make sure you guys get down there or well, make sure you have people go down there. There's no need for you to go down there you have no agents there, right? You're, you're, you, have, you serve more by just helping clients if you have no agents there, but if you do, um, come on down. Otherwise, send them over to me, Clay, uh, me, Nate, and the others, and we will take care of them um, at that event. Um, next thing I wanna kind of talk about real quick is just a, a, a simple reminder, guys. We are, when I say we, family first life, you as a business owner, you as an agency owner, you are an insurance, we, we are an insurance marketing agency and, or an insurance marketing organization. So our goal, if your goal and my goal, which many of us have a sim similar common goal is to build a big agency. Well, it starts with marketing, right? And it starts with getting the word out, right? And so I'm reminding you guys of that because, you know, a lot of times people are coming on and they want to get into this business and they, they get rolling, they're, they're writing business, they're producing, and then they wanna build an agency, but they, get the, they forget the number one most important thing, hiring people and getting people on board and telling people about this opportunity. And so, you know, for example, we have a, an event in Sacramento. Well, if I were you, and this is what I'm doing, so I'm sharing what I'm doing, is I'm putting ads in Sacramento to get people hired on to connect with me, connect with Nate, so I can actually meet them face to face, hire them on, train them and, and shake their hand and, and say, hey, I'm going to be the guy that's going to help you. Right. And so if I were you and, and, and I was trying to build an agency, I would do that. You can do that on ZipRecruiter. You can do that on Craigslist. Um, you can do that through Career Builder. I mean, there's different outlets that you guys can use to drive and grow your business. But if you're not marketing your business, no one is. Okay. Just, you know, newsflash, right? If you want to grow a business and you're not marketing your business, you're not growing a business, right? So uh, for those of you that want to grow your business, that, you know, that's on top of producing. If you just want to be a producer, no problem. We have a home here for you. We have tons of leads. 
best opportunity to produce. But if your goal is to, to build a big agency or, or any size agency, it doesn't have to be big, it starts with marketing. And so I wanna make sure that we, we continue to drive that home while we talk about production and our, our number one way we service anybody here is through produ production and um, a service of protection to our clients. Um, building an agency starts with marketing guys. So make sure you guys are putting out feelers, make sure you're putting out ads and different ways of getting in contact and having a conversation with people. Obviously you can use social media and other platforms like that too. All right, one housekeeping item that I do wanna talk about, and then we'll bring Easton on here is last week guys was the launch of our new platform for hierarchies and contracting. And so um, many of you or all of you at this point should have a link in your email for data validation, okay? So data validation allows us to link everybody together from a hierarchy standpoint and make sure that you're being paid the right way, you're under the right person, the, the, your organization is broken out accordingly. And so if you have not completed it, I ask you to go in there and complete it today. It takes only about, I don't know, all of 10 minutes um, to go in there, validate. If you need to change anything, you update it, you save it. It's super easy to use. But go in there, let's, let's, let's clean up the housekeeping stuff so we can get back to business, okay? All right, with that said, um, I am excited to bring on our special guest today, you guys. So we have Easton Patton coming in here to, to rip this up and just pour into you guys. And so, um, Easton, you there? Oh, I got you loud and clear, Julius. Awesome, man. Is, is that your place there or is that a, like just a background image? Oh, dude, that's a, I'm in a hotel. Oh, okay. And, and this is I, not the hotel. It's a, it's a green screen. <laughs> oh, that's pretty neat, man. I was going to say that you, when you, when you write as much as you write, I guess you can afford that, but I guess. Oh my gosh. Just, <laughs> That'd be a little well, bit well, too wild for me. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. So let me give you a proper introduction. First off, if you guys haven't been watching the scoreboard, let me share something with you. I saw this over the weekend and I was like, man, the timing of this is pretty awesome. So check this out, Easton. I hope you don't mind me giving you some love here, my man. But um, Easton Patton, if you're, if we stopped everything today, right now, Easton Patton's taking home the trophy, okay? Number one producer in all of Family First Life is on our agency call. This man has already issued $209,000 year to date through February. That means you're averaging about 105,000 in issue paid business in the first two months of the year, which is incredible. So Easton, um, we are excited and ecstatic to have you on. It is ridiculous the production you're doing and um, I, 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 you know, pr proud of what you've done, but I know you're probably not even you know, uh, a fraction of the way satisfied, but, but uh, share with us a little bit about what you've, you know, what you've done, kind of where you've come from, I guess, and uh, what, what you're really focused on this year. Cause this is, I believe this is what, like your second year now. Um, and so tell us a little bit about that. Kind of just share with us where, where you've been and what you're doing and what's different for you. Well, awesome. Dude. And thanks for all the, the hype. It's pretty funny to listen to somebody talk about you like that. So I appreciate it. Um, literally anybody can do that. By the way, I got asked the other day, like, how do you possibly do that? Well, if you run 44 appointments for two consecutive years, you're accidentally going to get a little bit better. And then if you don't let off the gas, stuff just start, starts to happen in bigger volume. So that's literally all that's changed is I never changed my schedule. Um, as I got more efficient, it was like learning and getting a little bit better. Um, I just kept running a heavy schedule. So I appreciate all that stuff, dude. It's, it has definitely changed. I will hit April 1st. So we'll be exactly two years from my start date. So I am just about sneaking up on two years coming up here in a couple of weeks. And it has been a crazy, insane ride. I remember we had met, I was pretty brand new. I think Julius, the first time that we met each other uh, when I came down to your guys' conference and they were like, Hey, we're going to have you, you know, do like a, just a little bit of brief, like phone type training. And I was like a few months in and I was like, well, I don't, I don't really think you guys need to have me on a, at like a live training. I literally just started here. I'm still really bad. I just buy a lot of leads so I, I can book more appointments that way. Um, and certainly a lot has changed, you know, since then. And I think, I think the perspective of it is pretty crazy, right? Because just like everyone, when you're brand new, and I don't know where exactly you want me to start. Um, but yeah, getting, getting started was, was crazy uh, stressful. And it was very, very hard for a little while. 
Um, I do, I do get to talk about this a lot. It's probably my favorite thing to talk about because that grind into success, it's like a, a really fun thing to be able to share with other people. And it really does truly prove that anybody, regardless of background or what your struggles are, you can always keep going. It's my 24 hour rule. Just give it 24 hours and see what happens. 24 more hours. If you just tell yourself that every day, that's my 24 hour rule. So if you're having a bad run day, a bad run week, in 24 hours, it could change. So when I was having my, my first 10 weeks where I was the worst producer in the entire company, all I kept telling myself was I just need 24 more hours in the field. And like this whole thing could change. Um, Cause I, I basically was trying to break even for my first two and a half months that I was working here and I was running 44 appointments a week. And I just kept doing that over and over and over. And if I would have given it nine weeks and six days, I wouldn't be here. Like I would be somewhere else probably hating my job, making nothing, working for someone else like I was before, you know? So I think that that, that 24 hour rule, if, if you guys can take nothing else away, anytime it's hard, just buy one more set of leads, give it 24 more hours and see what happens. Cause that is, that's when things went from like, I was going to be broken out of business to had my first $7,500 day, which led to my first 15 K week. And that literally changed everything. And as soon as I did that, you know, then you can start paying off credit cards and putting it back into more leads. And you literally just keep turning that over. And again, I, the whole point of this thing when you're brand new is to try to break even. And that was my strategy as a new agent. I just wanted enough to pay my lead bill so I could try it again. Because if I could do what Julius is doing, where he's doing a hall of fame producer, you're telling me that you did that like in a 12 month window. There's no way you didn't have 10 weeks throughout the year that were hard, dude. I mean, give me a break right? There's 52 weeks in a year to be successful. So why are you going to flush the rest of the year and a potential amazing career because you have 10 hard weeks? You know what I mean? So that's kind of like a good place that I like to start anyway. I love that, man. I love that. So 24 more hours, give it 24 more hours and everything can change. So what changed for you in that last 24 hour segment that allowed you to turn that corner, man? So I have this like rule where every single morning, no matter what's going on, whether it's because people did listen that we're human beings, like people got stuff going on personally, right? So you could have stuff going on at home. You could have this stressed out, like all my credit cards were getting turned off, which is how I was buying my leads. So I was in that spot where, you know, the wife had no idea that it was going how it was going. Like she didn't know I was that bad. So I couldn't tell her. And nobody really told me that this was a good idea in the first place. And now all my cards are getting turned off and I'm about to go out of business. And I kept having to wake up every morning and say, today's going to be a great day. And that's something that I picked up from Mike Killamet. I heard him say it on a training when I was like three days in. And I was like, wow, what a great attitude. No matter what bad thing is happening, if you just get up in the morning, which not that you have to do it, but that 4, 430 mark, it gives you tons of mental prep time and just say, today's going to be a great day. I'm going to go out with a great attitude and just let it rip and see what happens. What's the worst thing that's going to happen today? They're going to tell me no, and I'm going to go to my next appointment and try again. It's just, it's just keep trying over and over and eventually it's going to it's going to fix itself if you as long as you're doing all the right stuff now if you're if you're running like crazy buying leads and you're not asking for help and you're not training and you're super um, negative and you have a bad attitude and you're blaming everyone else but yourself this is going to be a very long road right but i think if you can take a little responsibility like my biggest mistake was i was getting into all this training stuff julius i was applying zero Like I would intake all this amazing tips and mentorship and, hey, this is what you should do next time. This is how you should speak to clients. This is how you should structure your appointment. This is what you should do in the first 10 minutes. I'm like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. Next appointment, I sit down. I'm like, okay, well, Eagle is uh, $64 for 10K. Do you guys want to do it? And I just immediately deleted all of the information that I reached out for help with, right? So that's Mm -hmm. the biggest thing that I would change, dude, if I could start over. I would keep my same schedule because I ran like a psycho for 90 days. I didn't take a day off right? Seven days a week for 90 days. I worked every single day because I wanted to learn it, but I wasn't taking the help that I was given. And that's like, you just want to hit yourself, you know, in hindsight, because you have great guys like yourself and, and Grady and Tordowski and all these top guys giving me help that I wasn't applying. And then I would call them back and tell them I made the same mistake again, because I didn't apply what they literally just told me to fix. So intentionality on your training can be a massive game changer for you guys. So if you're new or you're in a weird rut and you're just trying to figure out what's going wrong, just take the literal advice that they're giving you because I promise it will, it will change everything. Yeah, no, that's great, man. I, uh, so a few things I heard in there that, that 
A is super inspirational because, you know, a lot of times this is a mental game, right? And I think you've seen it, I've seen it. And, and, and if you're new on this call, you're going to see it if you haven't already. But, you know, if you wake up with the attitude, today's going to be a great day. What's the worst you can, what's the worst that can happen? Like Easton said is you book a few appointments or you don't, right? But if you're not being intentional with learning, what are, why are you not booking? Why are you booking, right? What, what's happening? And, and you got to remember that you or I or whoever you are, I am, it's because of you, right? And so what can you control to change the, the outcome, the result, right? And I think that's what you heard from Easton is he was very intentional. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And obviously your work ethic, man, that's, you know, 44 appointments. We talk about doing 30 a week. You're doing an extra 50% almost on top of that, which, you know, just by having more appointments, you're going to be crushing the field, which makes a whole lot of sense. Um, Dude, let's, let's talk about that for like two seconds. So sure. the entire purpose of boosting up a couple of extra appointments and putting in like this power weekend concept where you run Sundays, you know, like if you have a hard couple of days, door knock all day Sunday or dial for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, like keep the ball rolling. I knew that I was bad. And I knew that I was going to continue to be bad. So I wanted to have extra repetitions to account for my lack of ability, right? Because it, it doesn't require talent. You know, it just, there's a couple of small words you have to learn how to say in a specific order. And then that's how you start closing more business. But when you're new and you're making a mess, like I was, why not give yourself an extra 10, 15 chances at it, dude? I mean, or get, you know, at least get in front of some more people, whether that's off of door knocks or more appointments that you set. So that was like kind of a, a good strategy as far as, man, I literally, I know I'm going to suck. I know I'm going to close 20% when I'm new because the 25% of people that were telling me, yes, I was asking them if they're sure they don't want to think about it. Right. I was like taking sales away from myself. You know, that's how bad I was. So I think that if you can just pack your schedule a little heavier, pick up an extra day here and there, if you're struggling, it can make a big difference. So I won't hammer on that too much more, but that's why I was doing that. So, so let's talk about that. That's great. And let's also talk about booking the appointments, right? Cause when we met, that was the, the training you were talking about. And you came in and you did a phone clinic, right? You did, you went over your script, what you're doing. And I could tell right there and then, man, you're going to be good. Like, I just knew it. I could see it in, in what you were doing. I, like you, you have what it takes and obviously you're killing it. But um, can you share with people, because you're also growing a team, for people that are maybe struggling with booking appointments, what did you do in the beginning? How did you overcome that? What, what um, because we do have some people, like I was talking to a guy today on our team and he was struggling to book appointments. He's got leads and he's just, um, you know, and then some of people on here have recently went full time. So they now are out of a job right now. They're like, my salary has gone. So they have a little bit of that, you know, uh, what if this doesn't work out? Um, and I think you did a very similar approach, right? It sounds wow. like you were all in, went from corporate environment to here. Wife, you know, doesn't know your, what's going on. You're racking up the credit card. So talk to us a little bit about that, because I think that would be relatable to a bunch of people on here. Yeah, the phone stuff is so crazy important. And I, because the, it, when you're listening to trainings, the, if, you, if you go through a ton of different in-homes and they're all different, it can be pretty overwhelming. Dude, everybody does the same stuff on the phone. Every single person, they control the conversation. It's not this, you know, eight to 10 minute where you're just chit chatting with, you know, Bob and Mary on the phone, talking to them about nothing that has to do with setting the appointment. So I'm super direct. I control the conversation. I don't open it up for a bunch of questions. And I basically am just trying to get, you know, three, four, five yeses as far as like working, retired, single, married. Are they working? Do they have doctor's appointments? I want to understand their schedule um, so that I can set an appointment and have them be there for it. Because the no-show thing, it happens to everybody. I was 44 appointments a week, but I would see five or six people. So guess what that means, Julius? That means I'm missing something on the phone with tying my people down as a new agent. Right. So it's like, dude, I had 50 written in my calendar this week. I saw it. I saw seven. It's like, well, what can you walk me through how you were booking the appointments? Right. Where they did they say something about, hey, I think I might be home, you know, somewhere around four or five. I'm not sure. Can you call and let me know? And then you wrote them down because that is not an actual appointment. That is a like, hey, I'll door knock this person if I if I get no showed by my real one. You know what I mean? So from the phone stuff, it's I guess I can just run through it for like two seconds here if you want. Yeah. Right. So when somebody please. answers the phone, it's just, hey, Bob, yes, Bob, this is Easton Benefit Office, El Paso County, getting back to you about the request you'd sent in for the state regulated life insurance information. It looks like, Bob, you'd put on here 
April 1st of 62 is your date of birth. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Bob, well, I'm Easton. I'm the underwriter assigned to just do your short eligibility. As you read on the form, Bob, it's non-medical, so no blood, physical, urine. They just send me out to confirm your ID, make sure you're not tied down into a hospital bed full time, go through a short you know, eligibility, figure out what you qualify for. It should take 10, 15 minutes. Now, Bob, are you still working? Or are you retired or disabled? I'm working. Working. Got it. You single, married, widowed, divorced? Single. Single. Got it. Okay. So, Bob, I'm going to be dispatched to you tomorrow. I got to get this to like 14, 15 other families in your, you know, your part of Springs or your part of town. Um, you said you're working. What's the latest that you've ever been home from work? Oof, the latest? Seven. What's your average? Uh, around six. So usually be home between six, six thirty, seven's the latest. I don't have a six thirty or a seven actually. So why don't we just do between like seven fifteen and seven thirty? Does that give you plenty of time to get home? Yeah, that works. Okay, perfect. Now, Bob, you mentioned that you're um, it's just you at the house. You don't have like a significant other or anyone else you need to be present for the eligibility. No, just me. Okay, cool. So if you could just write my name down and like wherever you, you know, schedule your appointments or whatever, it's Easton. It's like the baseball bat, E A S T O N. Um, I'll be out there in a little SUV. I'm like, you know, six feet, huge nose. You'll recognize me when I get out there. Um, now that one, two, three main street, Bob, is that number on the, like the house mailbox curb or something? Like pretty easy for me to see on the house, right on the house there. Okay. Do I just park like right in the driveway or do I go on like the side of the street? Sidewalk works. Sidewalk's, Sidewalk's good. Street. Okay, cool. All right. Well, um, you know, Bob will be out there tomorrow. Um, again, Easton, should take about 10, 15 minutes. I plan on seeing you 7, 15, 7, 30. Just give me a little window. Like I said, I got to see 14 other people tomorrow. So they, they run me like a madman. All right. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Click. And that's it. And then it's done. No conversation, no asking other stuff. So the only times that the customer is ever speaking is to say yes, three or four times and, or talk about their schedule. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. I try not to do tons of open-ended stuff. Um, and when you do lean, like if they're retired, for example, like, Hey, do you have any doctor's appointments or anything else scheduled tomorrow? All of a sudden they have all this stuff going on and they're retired. Like how much could you possibly, you, you know, you're 73, you're retired, you're single. Where on earth are you going to be all day? Like, okay. So we got, we got a couple options, right? I'm going to be out there at either 445 or 6am, or I do have an 8am open. Do you have a preference? Are you more of a morning guy? You know, and then it's like, well, you know, I definitely don't get up by six. I usually get up at like seven thirty or eight. Okay, well, does nine fifteen give you plenty of time to get up? Yes. And then I just shift them to nine fifteen. But I'm trying to set that that eight or nine fifteen that's still open. And it's the same thing with the evening appointments, where they're like, yep, don't really have time tomorrow. Super busy all day. Okay, I I, I have a couple appointments open between eight p.m. and midnight. What time are you typically home? What's the latest you've ever been home in the evening? Same question. Because really, they're like, oh, no, I just, you know, I, I got to run a couple errands, drop the grandkids off, you know, pick them up from school, bring them home. You know, I'll be home by seven. Okay, let's do 7, 15, 7, 30. Because then you get the real answer back because they think we work nine to five. They're not mm -hmm. actually busier. So I like to make sure that they understand, hey, dude, my, I'm, I work like 16 hours a day. This is my schedule, 4.45 a.m. to midnight. So what time in that window are you usually home? And then you can control the time that you truly want to set and learn their actual schedule. That's awesome. That's solid. I think for new agents, I think that's one of the things they struggle with, right? They're not clearing the calendar. And I think you do that so well as you control it through close ended questions, only giving them an option or two and they, they have to pick one or they're going to, you know, tell you the other, if they're not going to want to do it. So um, clearing the calendar is huge when you're booking. All right. Awesome, man. So let's, I mean, let's talk about this. I mean, you did, you're on track for obviously like over a million dollars, right? Um, an issue paid business. Is that a goal of yours, by the way? Um, it is not, you know, my, the, the game plan for the year is to write as much as I need to write to build, you know, so I can kind of overfund my business through six, seven, eight months of the year. You know, obviously just like, you know, most managers and builders, we're trying to race to that million mark as fast as we can, you know? And so my schedule, and I'm not, this is going to sound super weird or whatever, but I didn't go out with the intention of trying to knock down a hundred grand in February you know, I just, I was trying to make up for the lost days of conference. So I overbooked my schedule and travel dates around conference so that I could make sure that I had the spike in production I needed because we're going to miss a few field days so that I could still pay staff and ads and all that other stuff, you know? So, and that's kind of going to be my game plan for the whole year 
is I'm trying to just write as much as I possibly can to fund when I need to. Now, if I start, if I knock down 15 or 20 grand over the weekend, like I really don't need to go out into the field on Tuesday and Wednesday. So I can spend Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, either having, you know, new agent calls, lead calls with new agents, hiring calls, interviews, whatever it is. Um, so it's, it's nice to be able to go out and run like a Friday, Saturday or a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and pick up, you know, your 10, 15, 20 grand, whatever your minimum production goal is so that you can pull out of the field and start mentoring and coaching all the new people that need the help. Cause you already hit your goal. Got it. So, I mean, I, I, I'm sure everybody's thinking the same thing. I mean, if you're doing a hundred thousand a month on, in production on your own pen, you got to only be able to do that in your home area. You're not traveling at all. Right. All I do is travel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I usually am gone um, either three out of four weekends in a four week or four out of five weekends in a five week month. Um, so I have, I live in Colorado. Um, I don't get a ton of stuff um, because I run a lead mix, right? Like I have direct mail all over the country and I run final expense and internet leads when I travel. Um, so as soon as I get 20 or 30 direct mail leads in an area, I'll fly out there, pick up a hundred life leads, um, order 20 final expense leads and go run Friday, Saturday, Sunday, really heavy, just like I did this weekend um, out in like Nebraska, Iowa. I'm actually supposed to be home right now, but uh, they canceled all my flights back to Denver because it snowed so much. So that's why you guys catch me in a hotel. <laughs> all right. So you rarely run in your home area? Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday here and there, I'll be home. I do get to stay one weekend home a month, um, but I am hiring in the areas that I have leads. So the, the, the kind of the game plan is to hire in these areas, to have agents that are, that live there, that want to take them over to bump their production out so they can have a home office in their region um, and kind of build out of that zone. You know what I mean? So that's kind of, that's kind of the plan. That's awesome. And, and, you know, you guys heard it from Easton himself, right? He's out there traveling, right? He's out there running leads where they're available, not even in his home area. So there really is no reason why you can't be reaching your numbers and your goals unless you're just, you, you don't want it as bad. Right. And so, um, but if your goals are to, to hit 20, 30, 40 K a month, you can obviously do that and it might require you to travel. So take it from Easton. He's the one doing it right now. And, and, and obviously having a lot of success with it. Um, all right. So I, I got to ask, man, I follow you on social media. You write some bangers in terms of premium, like five, six, seven on a very consistent basis. All right. So what tips do you have to help us help more clients to put more coverage in place to write bigger policies and, and so forth? So I'm super big on when I recognize a situation with a lot of potential slowing down so that I can understand the whole picture, you know, the, and again, it's not like you find all this stuff when you're in every single house, whether it's mortgage, final expense or life lead, it's not going to be every other home. You know, it, it kind of just times up sometimes where you run into a couple of people that, that make pretty good money. Their retirement is set up poorly for the survivor, you know, and those are situations where I will take a lot of time walking them through all that stuff so that they understand long-term income loss and how it's going to impact not just their house payments, but their regular bills too. So then you can provide a lot more value to them long-term because you can show them, hey, listen, I know you guys are doing really well as a household. Now you guys are going to lose four, five, six grand a month. So you're talking five grand a month. That's $60,000 a year of net take-home income that's going to disappear overnight, 600 grand over a decade. Like you guys understand that over a half a million dollars is going away over the next 10 years. So this idea of like, hey, we need you know, 50 to a hundred grand or 30,000 for final expenses, all of a sudden I can say, okay, well, we need to cover the 15 to 30 for final expenses. You guys have nothing in place for income replacement and nothing to cover the house. So that's how you start finding different uh, chunks of money and different losses that I can show them how to leverage their current income to create a large long-term benefit for the survivor, you know, by leveraging the life insurance company's money. Like the point of it is not for you guys to spend a lot, um, but if you can take, if you guys are putting this aside anyway, I'm a big fan of understanding, are you paying stuff down extra? What are you guys typically saving every month? Since you know, the income is going to change so much. What are you guys setting in an emergency fund? Because this six grand is going to go like, what are you guys doing to prep for that? Well, we have a uh, hundred thousand dollars of straight life insurance now. Perfect. That's the best news that I could have ever heard in that house. They're already insurance buyers. They understand the value of loss. So when does it term out or when does it end? 
because that's another place where we can maybe fix them or put them in a better spot. So this would be, obviously this will be kind of like an ideal scenario, but it's one that I just had where the husband makes 8,000 a month and the wife makes 1500 working part-time. He has no retirement or survivorship set up as of today because he's still full-time working. So you're talking 55 years old, a young, healthy guy, non-smoker, but he's the one that brings everything home and he's got 150 grand at work. Like, what is that possibly going to do for your spouse long-term dude? She makes 1500 a month. And he said, that is exactly why he filled it out. So now I can show him once the house is paid, the cars are paid, your utilities are paid. What on average you guys think you're setting aside two, three grand. Well, it's actually four grand. Okay, great. So what we're going to do is we're just going to borrow some of what you guys are already saving. You guys are already setting this money aside. So the good news is it's not going to change your budget at all. We're just going to take a little chunk of it. So now all of a sudden you're talking three, four, five, six, seven hundred 700 bucks a month that you can leverage with a big hundred to 200 to $300,000 insurance policy that potentially has an option to put cash back on it anyway. So now it's a long-term savings plan that we're leveraging that they're already saving. And now you write 700 bucks a month in the house they get it back at the end, they're covered for $300,000 in the window. So everybody wins across the board. It makes sense to the client because they can get it back and pay off a property and it covers a massive chunk in that, in that window. Again, you're not gonna run into those all the time, but when I find them, I go very slow through that and I make sure that they understand long-term income loss. I mean, if, you're, if your net take-home is $96,000 a year, that's almost a million bucks over a 10-year window that has gone forever. That's a lot of money. So is 700 bucks really not worth conserving your long-term legacy, protecting your wife? Of course it is, especially if they already have it. So that's kind of like a, I know it's a lot, but that's, that's how I am creating big premiums because I find money in, and I have them explain to me how bad they need it. And I show them how to leverage their money by using life insurance payouts. I love it, man. <clears throat> I love it. So you're just, you're building more value. You're building up the why, right? More through income, mortgage, et cetera, just painting that picture for them. Like if this happens, here's the, the, the impact of this loss. That's, that's brilliant. All right, guys. Um, Easton, I want to open it up to questions. I mean, I, I'd love for you to pour into them. I can sit here and interview you all day long, but I want to make sure we're asking some specific questions that can really help newer agents or agents that are maybe um, having a tough time turning a corner. So um, if you guys are going to be asking a question, um, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Let's, let's get a few questions to Easton. Um, he's here to pour into us guys. So, and if you're in the office and you want to ask a question, just raise your hand, we'll have you come up. But um, anyone online, first off, want to drop a question to Easton? Um, I have a question, Julius. <clears throat> go for it, buddy. Uh, Easton, what, what have you implemented from your trainings that either in home or in the way that you book appointments that have, that's enabled you um, to set up 11 appointments a day or whatever it is that you do? And that's a great them. question. Great question. So the first thing is on the phone, um, kind of what I was briefly running through earlier is slowing down to understand their schedule and then implementing two or three tie downs where I want to learn where do I park? Can you write it in a calendar? What's the color of the house? Are the numbers easy to see? Small stuff like that to solidify your appointment a little bit better. Um, and then creating yourself like a window of flexibility. I usually say like between 7.15 and 7.45-ish, give me, a, give me a little window in there because I'm running like crazy tomorrow so that I can account for being a little bit behind schedule. Um, you're bound to get no-showed and catch back up anyway. Um, but if you start having like three or four consecutive sits and they're good quality appointments, I never race out of an appointment to try to get to my next one on time. It's not a competition to who can pick up the check the fastest because you, you rush through an appointment. And this was what I did a ton when I was new is I would rush through an appointment to get to price. So I didn't miss my next one and they weren't even home. So if you're with somebody that needs your help, help them. Um, that's a, that's a big thing um, from a phone standpoint and the in-home stuff is setting a, uh, a non-negotiable 10 minute timer in the beginning of your appointments, understanding the situation. That's where you're getting your why questions out, right? Where I need them to explain to me, why did you fill out a request for life insurance? Did somebody pass in your family recently? Um, you know, did you wake up and you're like, listen, I'm 71. I don't have anything in place. My kids can't afford to bury me. I need to quit putting this off. 
talk to me about that a little bit and just let them explain to you their situation, what it's going to look like for them or their family or their spouse or whoever's in charge of paying for their stuff when they're gone. Um, I do that for about 10 minutes in every home so that, again, I can understand the situation and then I can put them in a better spot because then it's non-negotiable. Like you told me that your daughter would never be able to feed her children and keep her home if she had to come up with 10, 15, 20, 30 grand overnight for your stuff, you know, for your funeral. So let's find some kind of small amount that can help because something's going to be better than nothing. You know, and just that's, that's probably like the two things that I would say um, changed a lot of stuff for me. Thanks so much, man. You are inspiring so many of us. It's incredible. Thank you. I appreciate that. Good question, Andrew. All right. We got a few questions that were dropped in the chat, so I'll read them. Um, so Riyad asks, what has your lead spend been so far this year? And I think maybe what he's probably trying to get to is where, where are you at per week? Maybe that might break it down more so than over the last two months, but what do you spend in leads basically per week? On average, it's going to be somewhere between 2000 and 2,500 a week. Um, now I travel a lot. So I, but I, I run an extra day when I travel. So I always pick up extra leads. So I would not be shy about taking, if I had, you know, $1,500 of direct mail that flowed in for my travel trip, picking up another thousand to 1500 in a lead mix. Um, Cause I, I never want to go somewhere where I'm like, oh, I wish I would have ordered more leads or I wish there was more on the CRM here. Like I never want to ever do that because I've done that before. And then I get out there and I'm just banging my head off stuff all day. So mad because I didn't prep. So now I'll never travel without enough to make sure that, hey, let's say that 75% of these people don't answer. I can still at least book 20. You know what I mean? So I, I do build in a, a gap for error. And then when you hire someone in that area, you can just give them your overflow and it makes the business money. So then, then you win twice. So that's, that's kind of why I, I don't know if over purchase is the right word, but I always have enough when I, when I travel and run. And then how many leads would you say that you have new to you for every dial day on average? It's going to depend on the lead type. That's a great question too. And it's really hard to answer um, to give you an exact one. Now, when I was running all final expense, for example, I always had 50 non-negotiable. I had 50 brand new final expense leads in front of me, no matter what. And then on Thursday, I had 50 in front of me, no matter what. Every time I was getting a hundred brand new ones a week. Now those, you got to be really good at getting them because you have to order them three, four, five days in advance to make sure that you give them time to flow in so that you do have them to dial. The CRM thing where we have internet leads all over the place now is crazy. We did not have that even just two years ago when I started, you know, so when I run all internet leads and I did it the other week, I, you know, Julius, I don't know if you saw that, but I, I picked up 150 uh, one month old internet life leads in an area that nobody had really gone to in Colorado yet, because it's like really far away from everybody. It's like a little over two hours from any cities. It's tucked into the mountains. There's only a couple of people that live there. So they had accumulated over a long period of time. Um, it could have been really six months. I have no idea, but you know, some, some of the people said it had been a little while. So I got 150 of them, it was $600, dude. I just dialed them for 12 hours. Like I literally dialed for from 7.30 in the morning till 8.30 PM with like a little lunch break in the middle. Um, but I set 15 of them and then I ran and you know, I ended up having a pretty good weekend on them. I, don't, I think it was like 15 or 20 grand on the one month old life leads. Um, but I booked 15 of them and I drove two and a half hours to where nobody else is willing to run, you know, and I, it was a long, it's a long dial day. I don't like to do that. I prefer to have some newer stuff in, but I just heard some stuff about the lead. So I was like, well, I'll just try them and see what happens. Now it's not always going to be that big of a return, but I was literally just trying to write seven grand. I thought if I spend 600 bucks and I can pick up five, six, seven grand over the weekend, great. You know, it's no big deal. That's to me, that's a great return still. It's worth my trip. And then I just, I bumped into a, a couple of situations. Like I just, the scenario I just went through where I was able to capitalize on a big loss um, for the survivor. Got it. Um, so, you know, the one thing I want everybody to pick up on is Easton's work ethic, right? I mean, he dialed for 12 hours to get those 15 appointments, right? So for those people that aren't dialing that much, Easton, what words of advice do you have for them? And then we have another question after that. Yeah, I just... The entire, entire, they say 80% of what we do is on the phone. It's really a hundred percent. I mean, maybe 95% phone, but you got to have like 5% of that being leads. If you don't get on the phone and dial and book appointments, dude, it's impossible to make money um, with our system. I mean, we're a leads-based company, right? So 
if you want to buy them and then plug them in a route for me and door knock 150 people, that's all good. You know, let me know how it goes, but it's a leads based company. So why would you not, you know, everybody that's successful here dials Monday, Thursday, and they run. I mean, that's how everybody that's in the top 25 of the company does it. Um, so I don't, I don't know why you wouldn't do that. I just kind of adopted what everybody else told me to, to do. They said, Hey, you know, Zach Twardowski, 400 grand his first full year. You know, he's 23. Uh, this is exactly what he did. This is his schedule. This is how he worked. Um, and this was the result he got. And I said, cool, I'll do that. I mean, doesn't seem like it's anything unique, some weird biology nerd. And he did 400 grand, no sales experience. So I could probably figure out how to do that. Fair enough. Just rip off and duplicate. So, all right, cool. We have a question from Jessica. Jessica, are you out there? Yes, I'm here. Um, so my question is, how do you overcome an objection when you sit with the family and they're looking for like a hundred or over a hundred K worth of coverage, but they can't qualify for like the term or like the CBO? Like what is it that you use to overcome that? That's a, that's a great question too. So when somebody starts to tell me what they need before I know why they need it, I just say, well, it honestly just sounds like you guys are trying to get as, as much as you're literally eligible for that makes financial sense to you. That fair, fair enough. And like, what, what, of course they're going to say yes, because they want as much as they can get that's affordable. Like if, if you're a little bit banged up and you can't get a hundred grand in term, but you can afford a hundred thousand dollars of stacked whole life with, you know, three or four different companies. I don't have any problem doing that if it makes financial sense for you. So I just kind of take that back and say, okay, awesome. Well, I'm, I'm your underwriter in charge of figuring out where they're going to put you guys and what you're eligible for, you know? So if they're going to give you a 500,000, you guys only choose to take a hundred, you know, we can certainly figure that out. Um, but it sounds like you guys just want however much you could possibly get that makes financial sense to you. And that's almost always going to come back as a yes, ideally a hundred grand. Okay, great. I'll see what I can do. You know, and that's kind of how I overcome that out of the get go. If I know that they're sick or we go through the health stuff and they keep harping on it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Good question, Jessica. Yeah, that's, that's really good. That's really good. All right. We got another question. Uh, Zach, you out there, go ahead, man. All right. Perfect. Thanks for putting this on Julius and putting it on Instagram. He said, thank you for being on here. Super grateful. Um, that being said is um, whenever it comes to cementing after you have protected the family, what do you say? Do you emphasize, do you have a different method every single time? Um, what do you do to cement the cell? So when they're picking the options, as far as making sure that it's not too big of one, because I built too much Y and they overpurchase, I always try to get them to pick like the middle one or a smaller one. Cause if they just out of the gate and go, Oh yeah, 500, I'm, I'm in, that's nothing. I'm like, okay. So if your car breaks down, if the roof flies off your house, if there's a death in the family, if you can't work anymore, you know, depending on the situation, like this has to disappear into your budget year round, literally no matter what, because you know, listen, Zach, I don't care if you have it tomorrow. You know, I need you to have this in 15 or 20 years when you die, because it's going to matter to Mary, you know, at that point in time, it's not going to matter if you have it for six months and something comes up and you can't have it anymore. Remember? So I'm super down to, to help you do the $500 one that's 200 grand or what, you know, whatever it is. Um, but as long as you're sure that no matter what, this is going to disappear in the budget, because you can always add, if you want to let this settle in, for a month or two, and then we can come back and do your addition. That is typically what people do. And I always say that's typically what everyone else does is they start on a super no brainer number. And then they always add to it, you know, down the road, once that settles into the budget, does that make sense? And at that point, if they're like, yep, dude, I literally have 5,000 left over every month. This is not going to be a big deal. Like I'm in. Um, but if they're like, Ooh, good point, you know, Christmas time, kids, birthday stuff comes up, bad tires, car blows up, whatever it is. Maybe we should do like 250 to start. I'm like, okay, that's perfect. That's what I, that's what my parents did. You know, I say that stuff a lot in the house, like exactly what I would do for my parents. If you were my parents, that's what I would do. You know, and stuff like that. So that's probably like my one thing to try to get a, a higher persistency. I always pay for it when I don't do that because sometimes you can't help but get a little excited. You put 700 on the table and they immediately pick it. And they're like, this is going to be super easy, best decision we've ever made. Be careful. But that's what I try to coach him down if I can. I do forget to sometimes. Okay. So, so real quick, I'm sorry, Julius. Um, may I say one more thing? Go for it. Um, so more on the cementing part, though, like after the cell, you got the folder out. Um, you're about to head out. What are a few things that you do to make sure that you lock it in um, regardless after that? So I always leave an insurance coverage information sheet with them. Um, I don't know if you guys have those. I, I found one somewhere. 
in one of the Facebook groups that I just saved and kept um, where mm -hmm. I can write company policy number, draft date, I sign it and they sign it. So I can put all, I mean, policy number, all that stuff I can literally write on an insurance coverage information sheet and leave it with them. I explain to them um, if they get approved in the house, that's super easy. Like you're literally going to be active in 24 to 72 hours. And then since we put the uh, request for coverage in on the 15th today, it's just going to repeat itself on the 15th of every single month until you guys change that. You can move it 10 days either direction. Sound fair? Um, and then I would have them re-explain that. Yep. Nope. 15th every month. This is the company. This is a policy number. It's active right away. I was like, Hey, before I go, do you guys have any questions about anything? Like, does this all make sense to you guys? Again, I, I hammer on the budget thing earlier. So I don't mess with that a whole lot if they've already coached them down and they picked the company one. And then I just, you know, I kind of read out that insurance coverage sheet to them. If it's, if I have marketing materials for whoever I wrote them, like Americo stuff, I'll leave the, the folder, the Eagle Premier thing, the final expense planner, you know, just info on Americo. I try to order that stuff like every week so that I can have some stuff to leave them. And then I take a picture with them. I save it as uh, their icon on my cell phone. So when they call me, the picture of me and the family pops up on my phone. So I'll always know it's them. I put in my phone that it's uh, Eagle Premier, 270 bucks a month in my phone. So I know like this client, this is what they look like. This is what they purchased for me. So that'll flash up on my phone when they call me and that I'll always call you back in a 24 hour window. They run me like crazy all over the place. So if you can just give me 24 hours, I will always get back to you in that, in that little window. And that's, I try to just cement that stuff in. Like I'm your guy. I do the death claims. If you get sick and you need some of the money, I do that stuff for you too. I'm the one that's going to be here for Mary. Like I am your professional problem solver so that if anything ever happens to you guys, like you literally call me right away and I'll come out and help you do all this stuff. Would you mind sharing that um, coverage sheet? Yes. I know I have it on here. You can, if you can just send it to me and then I'll send it out to the team. Awesome, man. All right, cool. It's good stuff. Good question, Zach. All right. Uh, we have a few minutes left. We'll take one more question. If anybody has a question, um, looks like Andrew has something about dial day habits. Um, I'll read it here. It says, uh, it says, what kind of dial day habits do you have to, to lead to massive success on the phone and or including any stuff for mindset? Okay. So protecting dial time. Let me, let me pull you up here. So just about like how I, how I do my dial day. I'm sorry. Yeah. Primarily just dial day habits. What are your dial day habits? maybe for mindset, for activity, just for what, what helps you get, make sure that you have a successful dial day. Got it. Yep. So I always get up early. Um, I think, and it doesn't have to be four o'clock in the morning. I think that that between four and four 30 is a great time to start getting ahead on the day. Um, you see the 4am club stuff all over the company. I mean, everywhere it's on Facebook and stuff every day, especially because you guys are in the same group as Dave. So that you guys are getting blown up with it. Uh, I think that that's never going to hurt you to have a couple hours. I just know that if Sean sets his alarm at four o'clock in the morning every day and gets up and he could definitely retire yesterday and be fine for the rest of his life. Like I want to get up at three 59 so that I can get one minute extra than Sean does every single day. So, I mean, will I ever catch up to where Sean's at? I mean, I would be very, very unlikely um, because he owns a company, but if I can get a minute more than Sean every day, it gives me a chance right? And that's the whole mentality is give me a chance to win. So I, I'm just trying to get as much time on everybody else that's successful as I can, so I can just have a little bit more time. So I like to get up early. I start listening to dial trainings first thing in the morning, um, especially if you're a new agent and you're trying to get better on the phone. There's certain dial podcasts all over the place that you can find. I have a couple that I like. So Julius, if you want me to get those to you, like, hey, here's what I literally listened to when I was trying to get better. Um, there's tons of live dial training everywhere. If you guys have ever heard, if you don't know who Zach Luffles is, he is the weirdest dialer in the entire company and probably the most unique human being on the phone. So he's a great example of you can kind of be your authentic self on the phone. Just figure out what's going to fit you. Be your own person. Implement the stuff that works for you that you hear on training. So you're going to find out if it does or doesn't. Um, but I, I like to probably listen to Dom Rogers and Eric Schmidt stuff. I mean, they're super calm, relaxed, confident. They demand certain things on the phone. They very, uh, their presence is felt talking on the phone. I like to listen to that type of stuff to get me to neutral um, before I start dialing. So you have to start that. Well, I recommend you start dialing. You don't have to do anything because you're, 
your own boss, but I think everybody should dial at seven 30. And the, the whole thing is seven 30 to 12, one till you're done. Like I'm not insane. You know, I think if you take an hour to stop bleeding your eyes at a screen and get some food, maybe a, a, some energy in you or whatever it is, it's not going to kill you, but that doesn't mean you're at lunch till three 30 PM. Like it's, it's noon to one, one to done. So get back on the phone and just go, go, go until your schedule's full. And if your schedule is done at 10 o'clock, find a different money-making activity to do that day. You know, we're always trying to move forward in the business. You can train the rest of the day. You can put your first, you know, like, hey, this is me. I just started this new job post out on Facebook if you want to do social media stuff. But you have to stay lasered and stop getting distracted on dial day because if you can't dial and set appointments, you'll never, this is going to be a long, long journey. Awesome, man. That's awesome. Yeah, it looks like the team's asking for those podcasts and the trainings that you listen to. So if you can send those over to the email as well, and I'll share those with everybody. I can absolutely do that. Awesome, man. Well, you guys. Well, listen, uh, Easton, it's been a pleasure to have you on, man. I I really appreciate you um, pouring into our team, sharing with us a, a lot of great nuggets that I got personally out of this. So I know I found value. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our team have have found value. Guys, if you found value from Easton pouring into us, let's share some love. Drop a 100 in the chat if you got some value out of what Easton shared today. Um, I appreciate you guys. So I'm thanks, excited man, to for- see where, where your guys go. You got a ton of sharp people on your team, dude. Um, so I'm pumped for all of you guys. If If you guys ever want to go, so this is kind of my deal. If you have a couple of scenarios that you run into and you ever just want to run them by me really quick, Um, I like to touch base with a bunch of different top producers to figure out what they would have done in a certain situation. That's what helped me improve faster. Um, so if you have a couple of scenarios, like, Hey, I ran into this. I literally had no idea what to do. It takes like five minutes. It's not a big deal. Like, let me know. Um, and if I don't know, maybe I can grab Julius or Zach or something to give you a better answer. (laughs) Hey man, uh, we're all trying to learn. We're all trying to get better, but I a hundred percent agree. I did that when I was getting started, I would call likes of Grady, John Gavin, Frank Euphemia. Like I was calling different top producers, pick their brain for five, 10 minutes. Hey, how did you do this? And it, it definitely helped me um, improve my skill set. So thank you, man, so much. Hey, man, hey, I just want to share this on air. It's recorded. We are rooting for you to be number one this year. All right, you, it's time <laughs> for you to take that trophy, my man. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Awesome, brother. All right. Well, thanks for having, thanks for coming on and we appreciate you guys. Let's get back on dial. If you guys haven't had a break, get a quick break and then and jump on the FFL dial team. That's FFL dial team.com. And uh, Easton, thanks again, my man. Have a great, you got it, dude. Guys. Thank you.